Okay, so we've been looking at majority logic decoding. Okay, so I was describing the general principle to you in terms of finding estimates for each bit of the code word. And I was giving you an argument for how if you have J orthogonal parity checks. So parity checks orthogonal on a particular bit, then you can hope to correct J by two errors for each bit. Okay. So I'm going to make that a little bit more precise this time and uh, give you some exact things as to what happens when J is odd, J is even, etc. So 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 the best way to think about it is uh, through an example. So we're going to see an example and we'll see some points there and then I'll generalize that as the result. Okay, so I think that's the best way of doing it. It's not, it's not so fancy that you have to do it first and then see the okay, So we're going to start with a very simple example of a 734 code. Okay. And uh, how am I going to construct the 734 code? Okay, so it's going to be a cyclic code. Okay. So, so let me see how much of you, how much you remember about cyclic codes. If I have a 734 cyclic code, tell me about this code. Let's say 73 cyclic code. What will be, what can be its generator parameter? So what is the starting point? B D B four, okay. So it should also be irreducible. Irreducible. G of X is may not be irreducible. How do you find G of X? What is the other property? It has to divide something. It has to be a divisor of X bar eight or X plus seven. Okay, so it's going to be X plus seven plus one. So I'm going to factor X plus seven plus one. So how does X plus seven plus one factor? Plus one will always be there. What are the other two factors? X bar three plus X plus one, and then plus X bar plus one. Okay. So you have to take G of X to be one of these things. So let me say I take G of X to be. Uh, let me just think about it for one second, and then we'll pick it. Doesn't really matter, I think, but I want to make sure I have the right uh, thing for it. Okay. So we'll pick it as. 1 plus x times 1 plus x plus x bar. Let's say. Let's say we are. Okay. So this is the generator matrix. Okay. So so if you want to do if this is a generator polynomial, so let's let's simplify this. It's going to be 1 plus x plus x bar 3 plus x plus x bar plus x bar 4. So you get 1 plus x bar plus x bar 3 plus x bar 4. Okay, so if you make a generator matrix out of this, how will that look? 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. That will be the generator matrix. Right? And what about the parity check matrix? How do you think for the parity check matrix? There are four rows and seven columns. How do I, I get a construction for the parity check matrix? Right? How did I do that? You have to find some other polynomial. Just like you find the generator polynomial here, you have to find the generator polynomial for the dual. Right? You know the dual is also a cyclic code. How do you find the generator polynomial for the dual? So you have to divide x bar 7 plus 1 by g of x, you will get some polynomial, that is the check polynomial and then you have to do something to the check polynomial. What do you have to do? You have to do a reverse, right? then you will get the generator polynomial for the dual. So what is the check polynomial here? x bar 3 plus x bar plus 1. So if you do a reverse, what will you get? 1 plus x plus x bar 3. Okay, so the flip if you do, you will get 1 plus x plus x bar 3. So 1 plus x plus x bar 3 is the generator polynomial for the dual. So with that, let me do the parity check matrix. Okay, so the first row is 1 plus x plus x bar 3. And the next row is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. The next row is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. The final row is 0, 0, 0. Uh -huh. 
ओके ओके सो नाउ आई एम गोइंग स्टार्ट लुकिंग फॉर पैरिटी चेक्स व्हिच आर ऑर्थोगोनल ऑन द फर्स्ट बिट लेट्स से वी स्टार्ट विद दैट ओके राइट सो फॉर दैट अ गुड स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट is to list all the code words of the dual which have a one in the first position right that that makes the most sense because you know my orthogonal parity checks always have a one in the first position let me list out all the code words of the dual which have a one in the first position how many such code words will be there in the dual sorry half of the total right so 16 are there half of them will have one so eight of them will be there so let's try to list all the eight of them Okay, so it's a bit of a uh, it's a bit difficult without uh, looking at the matrix. So let me say I copy the matrix here. Okay, so another thing I can do, so something I've not done in the past, is to just basically come down like this. Okay, so I have the parity check matrix there. So let me uh, let me list out the code words. Okay, so what are the candidate code words? All right here. So the first one is clearly one one zero one. Zero zero zero. How do I find the other code words which are which have a one in the first position? Yeah, I will take the linear combinations. We have to keep the first row all the time, right? So you can't get rid of the first row, and then you can make arbitrary combinations with the remaining guys. So you will get eight different ones. The first one actually corresponds to zero 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 here, and then you keep putting more and more. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to write down as many as I can. Let's see. One zero one 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 zero zero. One, 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 zero, zero, zero. Then I'll do the last one. It should be one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. Then let's do the first three. It's going to be one, zero, 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 one, one, zero. I'll do the first, the third, and the fourth. It's going to be one zero first, third, and the fourth, right? So first, third, and fourth. So it's going to be one, 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 one. First, third, and fourth. One, one, one. Okay. Then we'll do the first, second, and fourth. Okay. So it's going to be one, one. First, second, and fourth. So it's going to be one zero, one. First, second, and fourth. Zero, zero, one. one. Okay, and then the last one is everything together. It's going to be one zero zero one zero one. Okay, so those are the candidate parity checks. Zero zero zero. Oh, first, second, and fourth. Yeah, right. You're okay. All right. So from here, I want to identify parity checks which are orthogonal. Right. All of them would qualify in the first criteria that the first bit is one. But then I also want the other bits to never overlap. Okay. So suppose I take the first one. What else would be a first, fifth, and seventh? Other two candidates: second, third, fourth, fifth, and then fourth, seven. Okay, so these three guys satisfy the property that I want. They are orthogonal on the first bit. Is that correct? Okay. So what are these parity checks? The first parity check says C zero plus C one plus C three plus zero. This one says. C zero plus C four plus C five equals zero. This one says C zero plus C two plus C six equals. Zero. Okay, I'm just numbering from zero, so it's a little bit different. So you see, C zero is checked by all three of them, and then one and three are involved in the first case, four and five are involved in the second case, two and six are involved in the third. Okay, so they don't have anything in common. So using these three checks, I can definitely correct one error. Is that okay? So 
these are uh, orthogonal parity checks. Okay, so suppose let's say the third check was not there. Okay, so maybe maybe with just two checks, uh, can we do anything? Is what I'm going to do next. But let's. Uh, so this is convincing, right? So we found three. This is enough. See, remember this is a cyclic code. So once I find parity checks orthogonal on the first bit, I'm done. Right? What is the path parity checks orthogonal on the second bit? Simply take this bit and shift it right right by one. Okay, and then the next bit, next bit, so on. Just keep shifting it. You get all. Okay, so you can correct one error by measure out the logic decoding in the 734 code. Okay. So now I point out one minor thing here about how many parity checks you need to correct one error. Okay. So let me write it down a little bit more clearly. So how will my uh, how will my uh, decoder work? Okay. So let me write that down also. Okay. So I'm going to try and evaluate three checks. Suppose I'm given a received value. R zero, R one, R two, R three, R four, R five, R six. What will I do? A first check I evaluate is, so it's called S one. Will be R zero plus. No, no, no. This is not work that way, right? So it turns out we can do it in two ways. So the way I described it, I would get C zero cap one to be equal to what? R one plus R three, and then I will have a C zero cap two, which would be equal to R4 plus R5, and then finally I would have a C0 cap 3, which would be equal to R2 plus R6, right? And then what would I set C0 cap to be? Majority of C0 cap 1, C0 cap 2, C0 cap 3. Okay, so that is like correctly estimating the bits of code from the orthogonal parity checks that I have. Okay. So you can also think of this as an evaluation of the error polynomial. Okay. So instead of finding the code word polynomial one bit at a time, you can find the error vector. Okay. So I've been saying polynomial. I don't know why I'm saying. It. Instead of finding the code word vector one bit at a time, I can also find the error vector one bit at a time using a very similar idea. Okay. So notice, instead of evaluating C0 uh, like this, I can also say. Uh, I can also say the following. So, what do I? What can I say? So, so, so this is this is clear, right? So, this finding the first bit of the code word is clear. But suppose I want to find the bits of the error vector. How would I do that? Okay. So, what 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 should I do? So, for that, so you would have error vector e, which is again e zero, e one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you have the field vector r is c plus e. Okay. This is given to you, right? So you evaluate syndromes. Okay, so the first syndrome I evaluate is going to be uh, S1, which is R0 plus R1 plus R3. Right? Go back and look at what I had here. Right? Right? The first syndrome is R0 plus R1 plus R3. The second syndrome is R0 plus what? What will be the second syndrome? R4 plus R5. Okay, so let's say I stop with this. Okay, so I'll show you what happens when I stop with this. Okay, so okay, okay. So what do I know about R0? It is E0 plus C0. So I can put that in, and then I would know C0 plus C1 plus. C3 is zero, so definitely S1 is also equal to E0 plus E1 plus E3, and S2 is E0 plus E4 plus E5. Is it okay? Right, that much. Enough. All right. So now it turns out I can do the following about E0. Okay, so from S1 and S2, I can set E0 cap to be majority of S1 comma S2. Okay, suppose I do that. Okay, so, so, so suppose I said these are the terms to be majority of S1 comma S2. Tie tie implies zero. Okay, so what do you mean by tie? If S1 is equal to S2, I will simply say zero. Okay, but okay, this is the rule I'm going to use. Notice this is very different from the rule here. Okay, so it's a little bit different, but you will see this rule is also good enough to correct one error. Okay, so let's 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 look at that. So here. 
and using all the three orthogonal parity checks and definitely correcting one error by majority and that will be perfectly clear, there is no problem there. Here I am using only two of these things and hopefully this should work out, I think it works out. Okay. So, I am going to set E0 cap to be equal to the majority of S1 and S2 and in case there is a tie, okay, so if S1 is 0 and S2 is 1, there is no clear majority, right? I am going to say E0 is 0, E0 cap is 0. Okay, so, let me write that down very clearly, pi, pi means E0 cap is set to 0. So, we break the tie in favor of 0, that is what we do. So, let us look, look at this case and try and see if it can correct one error. Okay, so can, can you think about it? Can you tell me if it is going to correct one error or not? What is the meaning of correcting one error? There is one error I should determine E0 accurately. Okay, will that happen? Why will that happen? Yeah, so that is the thing. So you should see if the error occurred at E0 or not. Okay, suppose the error occurred at E0, okay, that is the only error, other things will not be an error. What will be S1 and S2? both will be 1 and so you will decide E0 cap is 1. Okay. Suppose there were no errors in any of these things, both S1 and S2 will be 0, so you will get E0 cap to be 0 again. Suppose E0 is not an error, okay, E0 alone is not an error, only one of either of these things can be an error. So one of S1 will be 1, S1 will be 1, S2 will be 0 or S1 will be 0, S2 is 1, but then what am I doing when I have a type? I break it in favor of 0 which means E0 has this accurately determined. Okay. So, so if you think about it in terms of the error vector, determining the error vector, if you have J orthogonal parity checks and J is even and you use the same logic for finding E0, e, the error vector, even if J is even and you have J orthogonal parity checks, J by 2 errors can be found. Okay. As long as you break the tie in favor of C. Okay. Alright, so in the C0 hat it may not be very clear how why is it that they being even is good enough, but when you think in terms of the error vector it is not very clear, okay, so it has to work out correct. Alright, so that will be a result which we will keep in mind, we will say, so in the result over here, if we have J orthogonal parity checks, J by 2 or so even or odd, it doesn't matter. J by 2 errors up. Is that okay? So whether it's even or odd, it's going to work out. You just have to remember that in the the best way to think about this is in terms of the error vector, not in terms of the code vector. If you think in terms of the code vector, you will get confused a little bit. Well, it works. But you move on to the error vector and then use this idea of how you break the tie in favor of 0 and whether that bit, the particular bit you are looking at might be an error or may not be an error. If it is an error, then you have less than, strictly less than j by 2 errors outside, so majority will be clearly 1. If it is not an error, then you will have, uh, you might get a tie, but if you get a tie, you just break the tie in favor of 0, anyway it is not an error, it works. Okay? So that is the idea. So you think about it very carefully, this will work. So you keep the uh, error vectors in mind, this will be nice. Well, okay? So I did not formally prove it, but it is clear. I mean, you write down the argument, you will get the same thing. Okay, so it is a simple proof by example. But okay? So this is how you look for orthogonal parity checks and do decoding. And clearly, I convinced you that the 734 cyclic code that we had here has a simple majority logic decoder, which works very nice. So what we are going to see next is a more, slightly more complicated example, we will take the 743 Hamming code. Okay, so let us take the 743 Hamming. Here we will see it is a little bit more complicated and I will tell you slightly more advanced majority logic decoding. So the previous majority logic decoding is what is called one step majority logic decoding. So you are doing it in one step, you can also do multiple steps. And it turns out the 743 Hamming code will need multiple steps. I am going to describe that with an example first. Okay, so we will see the example is quite simple. We will we'll come to it and then we will uh, deal with the example first. Okay, so the Hamming code I will take g of x to be 1 plus x plus x bar 3. Okay, so yes.
Yeah, I mean that's not guaranteed, right? So if you have if you have less than j by 2 errors, then definitely you find the code. If it corrects correctly, it will go back to the code. If you have greater than j by 2 errors, it can still work. I mean, there's nothing that stops you from doing this if you have greater than j by 2. But then you're not guaranteed anything. May or may not be a code. Some other bits that can happen. In fact, it might even work for everything. I mean, it depends on how. So, so if it, it only has to work for the message bits, right? As long as it works for the message bits, you're happy. The parity bits can be an error. Who cares, right? Only the message bits are retained. So, if, as long as it works for the message bits, you're okay. So that's why I'm saying it might even work correctly. See, you don't worry about getting the code word. It's enough if you get the message. How do you get the code word if you, are, if you only get the message? Just encode it again. Always encode it and get the code word. It's no big deal. It's enough if you get the message bits correct. Okay. Yes? Not when there are j, j by 2, right? So if it's j by 2, if e0 is an error, okay, then there can be only strictly less than j by 2 errors outside of it. So a majority of the checks will be 1. If a majority will be 1. There will be no type. There is no chance of a type. Right? If there's only j by 2 floor errors, if already e0 is an error, the remaining days you cannot have j by 2 errors. You will have strictly less than j by 2. So you have j equation, so there will be a clear majority which is 1. There is no problem there. In case e0 is not an error, then you can have a type. At, the, at work you will have a type, but the type you are breaking in favor of 0. So it's okay. That's the idea. So you just look at when you can have a type closely, you get the answer. You cannot have a type when e0 is an error. That is the important thing. Only when e0 is not an error, you can have a type. So of course you can settle it in favor of 0. Okay? Alright, so we go back to this guy. Okay, this is a generator matrix. What is the parity check matrix for this? I wrote down just now, right? You can think of it in so many different ways. The parity check matrix will come out. This is a this is a parity check matrix for that code, right? So it's, that's how it worked out. So it's 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so the parity check matrix is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 
Okay, so you find parity checks orthogonal on not just E zero, not but not just one on zero and two. Okay, so previously you were finding parity checks orthogonal on zero alone. Okay, so it has to be one and zero, and no other thing should overlap. Now I say my parity checks have to be one at zero and second position. Okay, zero and second position they have to be one. But then the other things should not repeat. Let's see if we can find two checks which satisfy this condition. Okay, first term is e zero plus e two a good choice? Maybe it's not a good choice. Is this correct or did I make a mistake here? Did I make a mistake in the red sauce? It's okay. Ah, first and fourth, you are right. Okay, should look good. Okay, so first and fourth. So if you look at the first curve and the fourth curve, what happens here? What happens to these two checks? What are the first check and the fourth check? First thing tells you C zero plus C two plus C three plus C four is zero. What does this guy tell you? C zero. Let me write C zero plus C two. I'm going to write C one plus C five equal to zero. Okay. So what happens here is these two checks both involve C zero and C two, but outside of it there is there is what there is no overlap. Okay. And uh, okay. So that's that's first. Okay. So now what can I do? If I think in terms of the error vectors, E zero plus E two, I can find with these two. Okay. All right. Now what about C zero and C one? Are there parity checks orthogonal on zero one? Yes, four and seven. Okay, so what do we do with four and seven? So the four one is already here. Seven one is here. What is seven? C zero plus. I'll retain C one here so that it's uh, so C one plus C four plus C six equals zero. Okay. So what what can I do with these two guys? Okay, so I have to draw the thing carefully. So let me draw. What can I do with this equation and this equation? I can find e zero plus e one. From the first two equations, I found e zero plus e two. From the next two equations, I found e zero plus e one. Then what can I do? Find e zero for the majority of those two. Okay, and always break ties in favor of zero. Okay, that is the rule that we always use. We find e zero plus e two from the first two equations, e zero plus e one from the next two equations. Then some e zero sum e zero plus e two and e zero plus e one take majority of those two we get again e zero. So okay, so that is two step majority logic decoding. Let me write that down once again more formally. So first step I will find the syndrome R zero plus. Let me retain this a little bit here so that I know R zero plus R two plus R three plus R four. I know that this is the same as e zero plus e two plus e three plus e four. The second syndrome that I find is R zero plus R one plus R two plus R five, and this is the same as E zero plus E one plus E two plus E five. Okay. And then the third syndrome I find is R zero plus R one plus R four plus R six. This is the same as E zero plus E one plus E four plus. E5. Okay. Then what do I set it to? First, I find an estimate for e zero plus e two hat. I call it like this. Okay, so it's an estimate for e zero plus e two hat. What is that? Okay, so so actually this is not maybe a good idea. So I'll simply say e zero hat plus e two hat. Okay, this is what this is majority of s one, s two, and then again i implies zero, right? What do I do with that? And then I'll find e zero cap plus e one cap. How will I find e zero cap plus e one cap? Majority of s two s three. Once again, pi in favor of zero. How do I find e zero cap now? Majority of e zero cap plus e two cap, comma e zero cap plus zero. Again, pi is in favor of zero. And in every step, if there was only one error, I will always be correct. So overall, if there is one error, I can correct it. And if I have an error, I can get it. 
Uh, I don't know, I'm not able to answer the question immediately. Maybe you can look at it very closely and the way the party checks are working out, it may not be able to correct two errors. I'm not sure, that's all. So, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's too complicated to analyze it very simply. So, let me just leave it at that. Because we have to see how exactly the errors will translate. I mean, you can write a exhaustive search to search over all the error patterns and find out which error patterns it can correct. That is one way of doing it. I mean, I'll imagine the programming you can do is 7.4 is not a big number. But if you ask me to analyze it, it's a little bit more tricky. Okay, there's too much dependence, basically. You can't just say this is independent of that kind of So you have to look at it very, very carefully and it may not be worth it at the end of the day. Okay? I've, I've tried it in the past for more complicated cases and I never got further than some complicated cases. It's, it's difficult. It's not very easy. Okay? Yes? Okay, so the again the problem there is, uh, yeah, I guess if there are less than j by two errors, that might work. So that's an interesting idea. I mean, may, maybe maybe there are versions of the decoder which use that. Okay, so in some subsequent things, we don't use the same parity. Okay, so it's it's a question of how you want to implement also, right? In, in your implementation, maybe it is more economical to compute all the parities first and then do the numerical logics. Right? So, depending on where you are, how fast you want it to be, maybe you want to compute the parities, uh, I mean, parities as you go and then keep doing majority again and again, then you can do what you are saying. As long as there is less than j by 2 errors, there is no problem. It will always work. This step of your process is working out correctly. And uh, one nice thing about what you are suggesting is, as you go forward, you will, your decoder will improve dramatically. Right? So, so what happens in practice? So, so that's a very interesting question because, in the, for instance, in polar codes and all that, which is the, like I said, is an adaptation of Reed Miller codes which takes it close to capacity. They use some ideas like that. It's called successive, successive decoding. So you decode one bit first and then use that decoded bit in the next version, next version. But then the sequencing is very, very important. The first bit you decode must be able to tolerate a lot of errors. Okay, it should have, it should have very good protection. So then you decode it and then use it in the next one. The last bit you decode is, uh, is it the other way around? I think I get, I get mixed up in this, but the sequence in which you do it is critical. Right? That is one thing that's very important. So in polar codes and all, the main thing is about in what sequence you decode. That is still a bit unknown. People don't know exactly how to do what sequence to it. If you do it in the wrong sequence, you'll go for a pass. Then you will be very, very bad. So, okay, so let me step back a little bit. As long as correcting errors within the error correcting capability is concerned, you can do it in any order. Nothing will stop you. When you want to go beyond the error correcting capability, like polar codes now, you want to get close to capacity, you want to go way beyond the error correcting capability, you can do sequential decoding like this to your advantage. Okay? But you have to know the right sequence. Knowing the right sequence is, doesn't seem to be that easy, but there are methods today to know the right sequence. You do the right sequence, then you gain a lot. So all that is beyond error correcting capability. As long as you are within the error correcting capability, that's the problem. Okay. Anything else? That sounds like interesting here. <coughs> All right. So this is majority logic decoding. So far, I have not explicitly mentioned uh, Reed Miller codes. Right. I have only talked about the 743 Hamming code, but we know the 743 Hamming code is very closely related to the 844 Reed Miller code. So you extend it, you get the 8 Reed Miller code. And the extension does not really give you any error correcting capability. So you just correct with 743 Hamming code, well, it's done. Okay. So what we are going to see now is why this will work for an arbitrary Reed Muller code. Okay, the same kind of logic, this multiple step majority logic decoding, one can show will always work for a Reed Muller code of arbitrary order. Okay, so that is the that is the main result. So the main result is We want to do read mula for r, 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 comma m, r plus one step majority logic decoding. And 
correct. This guy, and correct. Answer. Two bar one bar one bar minus one. Okay, so this is the main result. Okay, so so far we saw one step and two step, right? If you go to the Reed Miller code of order r and uh, length two bar m, then you will have to do r plus one steps. Okay, in general. Okay, and at the end of the day, you are guaranteed to correct the exact error correcting capability of the Reed Miller code. Okay, so as you can see, the implementation is when compared to the Bellicam, Massey, and all, the complexity in the description of the algorithm is very simple. There is no finite field involved. It's just measure the logic decoder. Just keep finding. Some majority again and again. You find parities, find majority, find parities, find majority. It's very simple implementation. There's no complicated uh, equations to solve and all that in finite fields. So in a way, it's very simple. But then you'll see the implementation is a bit tricky. So doing it for a general R is not that easy. Okay. So I'll try to give you a feel for why this is true. We may not be able to prove every step. I'll try. I'll try my best to give you uh, an idea of why this is true. Okay. For this, we need a view of the Reed Miller code from a geometric point of view. So that's what we're going to see next. And uh, the first result that is uh, needed here, okay. First result you need here for this is the following, okay. So, so before that, let me let me just let me just describe uh, zero one m as a finite product. Okay. It has a name. It's called. Uh, it can be called as what's known as EGM comma two. Okay, EG standing for Euclidean geometry. M is basically the dimension. Two is the field size. Okay, so just putting G of two. But of course, extensions here. EG of M comma two par M two par S is also possible. You go to a larger field and then look at its uh, thing as geometry. So what do I mean by geometry? Geometry means there should be points and lines, okay, points and curves and planes and lines. So that's called geometry. So you just change your jargon to something like that, it becomes a geometry, right? So at the end of the day, it's just geometry. But uh, this, it's it's nice it's nice to think of it that way. It gives you a nice intuition to think about these things. Okay. So what do you need in a geometry? Basically, you need a set of points. Okay, and this is basically zero one name. Okay, so if you're confused, think of always the real plane R two, right? You have a set of points, right? An infinite set of points, and then what else makes it a geometry? You should be able to define lines and planes and all that. How do you define a line in R two? Set of all x y that satisfies an equation like a x plus b y plus c equal to zero, or a and b both are not zero. Okay, so that gives you a line in the In R two, okay. So a linear equation involving the two variables x and y, one standing for each dimension, gives you a line in R two. Okay. So if you go to R three, what does one linear equation give you? Gives you a plane. Okay. What about two linear equations? What do they give you? Assuming that equations are independent, etc., it gives you a line. Okay. So, so there is generalization of this. If you go to R n, if we give you, if we give you one equation, you get what's called the hyperplane. Okay. So it's called the n minus one. Hyperplane. Okay, and then if you give n minus one equations, you will get the line. Okay, but then you have so many other things in the middle. All of them are some objects. Okay? You can think of them, all of them, as some things. In the finite geometry, those things are called flats. Okay, so it's very common to call them flats instead of planes. Okay? Because there are only a finite number of points. It's not so so interesting to call it a plane. So people call it a flat. Okay, lines are still called lines. But usually they say flats. Okay. It's just a terminology. It's not so not so critical. Okay, so how do I describe the line now? Okay, so a line is basically set of subset of points Okay, so first of all, when I have zero one m, I have m dimensions. So I should have one variable each for each dimension. So my variables will be v one, v two. Yeah, same as before. Okay. Now a line will be a subset of points that satisfies that satisfies a linear equation. So what is my linear equation? So let's just say summation a i b i plus b equals 
Okay, so I equals 1 to m and ai is basically 0, 1. Not all ai can be 0, and in that case, we will not get anything interesting. B is also a bit. Okay, so I should not say it's a line, this is not a line. Okay, so I'll put, I'll remove a line. It's basically what's called an m minus 1 uh, flat. Okay, you can also call it a hyperplane. M minus 1 flat is also called a hyperplane. This is just jargon, it's not, there's no critical concept here. It's just a name for a subset of points. Okay, so if you think of geometry very abstractly, you have a set of points and certain subsets of those points you give special names. You say a certain subset is a line, you say some other subset is a circle, some other subset is a parabola. And you just deal with those subsets interestingly and some nice properties come out for these subsets. Okay, any two lines will intersect only in one point. Okay, you, you define lines that way only. You can't say a parabola is a line. And then you'll have two parabolas intersecting two points. It becomes crazy, right? So you have you have some structures which you define for those sets, and there's some properties that come because of it, and then you study them. Okay. Similar things will happen here. Okay. If you have two hyperplanes, that can they intersect. Okay. So what is two hyperplane? One hyperplane is one equation. Another hyperplane is another equation. So if you put both equations together, what will you get? You will get an m minus two flat. Okay. So two m minus one flats will intersect in a m minus 2 flat. Okay. Two m minus 2 flats will intersect in a depends. Right? <laughs> so when you, when you look at it a little bit closely, it depends on the equation. So assuming there are independent, it can go to m minus 4, it can be m minus 3, etc. Et okay. Right? Is that okay? So that's the way to think about it. They can intersect in uh, so many different ways. So just put the equations together, you'll get you'll get these things. Okay. So this is an m minus 1 flat. Now in general, what is an m minus r flat? Okay. An m minus r flat Bcm comma 2 will be basically set of points satisfying. Satisfying R equations, right? Okay, what are these equations? They are all linear equations. Okay, so it has to be linear. They are J, V, J plus V, I equal to 0. So we will go from 1 to M. This will have to be true for I equals 1 to Okay. So each equation should be active. Okay. So if, 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 if you can't just repeat the same equation twice. Okay. So it's important. Each equation should be active. So you, you can't have there should be some linear independence between the equations. Which they should enforce something. So this is a, a R equations and M minus R flat. Okay. So let me give you an example. So an example here will probably be useful. Okay. So let's say let's take e g of m comma three. That's the most interesting example. Okay, there are 8 points, 0, 0, 0. You can think of so many lines. For instance, you can say V1 plus V2 plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, what is this line? Okay, this is a line. This is not a line. This is actually a hyperplane, right? So, it's a 2 flat, right? So, 2, did I do that correctly? 3 comma 2, I'm sorry. E3 of 3 comma 2. This basically the set of points is 0 and 3. The variables are v1, v2, v3. If I say v1 plus v2 equal to 0, I have a 2 flat. What are the various points? You can just list it out. It's not, it's not very hard. Right? So v3 can be arbitrary. v1 and v2 have to be, have to XR to 1. Okay? So you can have either 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, or 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay? In general, how many points will an M minus R flat have? You have M variables, you have only R equations, you have 2 part M minus R. Okay, so that also makes sense. So 2 flat has 4 points. Okay, so if you want a 1 flat, what should you do? 
if there's one more equation, so look for v1 plus v2 plus 1 is equal to 0, and then you say v1 equal to 3. Okay, so you will get only 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1. Okay, so you see just like lines can be contained in planes, one flats will definitely be contained in two flats. Okay, there's no problem. So if you have one flat, it will be contained in two flats. So how many two flats will contain a one flat in this? How many two flats will contain a one flat like this? Huh? Okay, so it's it's an interesting question to think about. There are so many other uh, parameters. So those are those are things that are important. Okay, so in for our analysis, questions like that are important. Okay, how many one flats will be contained in a two flat? Okay, so it's 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 ridiculous to ask the question in R two. How many R three? Because everything is infinity in R three, right? So how many how many planes will contain a line? Again, we'll say infinity. Okay, so here it's not infinity. Everything is finite. There's only a finite number of points. Okay, so before that, let me ask you another question. How many m minus R flats? are there in EG of m comma 2. Can you answer that question? How many m minus r flats are there in EG m comma 2? Okay, so you should be careful about it, okay? So because you might be counting multiple times the same thing. Okay, so you should not do that. You, you, because if you just multiply by some linear equation on the side, you will get the same thing. So you also need some linear independence there. It's, 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 a, it's a computation, but there are answers to such questions. Okay, you can answer all those questions. You can come up with numbers for all those questions. Very simple numbers. How many one flats are there in a two flat? Should be a very simple answer. How many two flats contain a given one flat? That is a very simple answer for it. Okay. I will not do the computations here. Maybe in your uh, in your tutorial there will be some question, but that's totally optional. You don't need to know the numbers here. Just remember that these numbers can be accurately computed, and it's a very simple computation. Okay. It's not a complicated computation. If thinkable for a while, you'll get the answer. What is the question? Any two or m minus r points again? Mm. No, 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 it won't be true. That's not true. Unfortunately, it's not true. So it's not a it's not that rich an algebra. Yeah, it's, it's not like that. So any set of points on the R2 do not form a line. Right? So it says infinity, but here also you can't you can't say that. Two only. Yes. So if you say between any two points in EG of three comma two, there will be a line. That is true. It's not two power m minus r. It's m minus r. If you have m minus r points, you're right. So you know, if you have m minus r or what? I think something. Like yeah, m minus r. Yeah. If you have m minus r points. Then through it, you can write an equation. So it's easy to write those equations. So you can write an equation involving all those points and have a two uh, m minus r flat through that. Okay. So it's just uh, I mean so this is a bit uh, complicated. I'm not doing it in detail. I know that we, we don't need, really need to know the depths of these things. Okay. So we only need to know some basic definitions and some equations like this. The reason why this is interesting for us is once you have an m minus r flat. You can go from the M minus R flat to a code word of a read code. Okay, that's what's interesting. It turns out what are known as incidence vectors. So if you have a subset, you can also define an incidence vector for a subset. What's an incidence vector for a subset? You have a set of all points. If you have a subset, wherever the elements of the subset are there, you'll have a one. Outside of that, you'll have a zero. Okay, so you can form a two power m length vector from every subset. It turns out those vectors of M minus R flats are code words of the read code. Okay, so that's why it's interesting. Okay, so I'll I'll describe this in more detail in the next class. We're running out of time. So it turns out M minus R flats are very very closely connected to code words of the Reed Miller code R M of R M I. So that's why it's interesting to us. Okay, and it turns out these flats play an important role in giving us parity checks, which can be used for Reed Miller code decoding. Okay, so these M minus R flats are very nice objects in the finite geometry, which gives us good code words and parity checks for my Reed Miller code. Okay, so we will see that in the next class. But if you are interested, there are lots of resources to read about these things. There are lots of interesting finite geometries. There is one geometry called the Fano plane, which is really, really, very, very interesting. It's just it's related to the simplex code that we had before. So there, there are lots of interesting finite geometries also. It's not just R2 is not the only interesting geometry. Okay, so we can read it up. Uh, so next class, I will tell you what the connection between this M minus R flats and Reed Miller codes is. You see, the connection is very simple. This is just one equation, right? You can add one on both sides. 
So we'll get a one equals something equation. When you multiply all of them together, you will get a degree r polynomial. Okay? And all these points satisfy a degree r polynomial. And that's exactly how we define a regional report. So all these n minus r flats must be there in the regional report. So it's a very simple idea that gives you a powerful connection. Okay? So I'll prove that in the next class. Okay? Short way